Burt. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I know we've taken extra time to go over some other stuff, and I won't be long tonight. I know there's nothing interesting on TV to watch today anyways. Um, but hey, thank you for being faithful to church, even on a day like this. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Would you stand, please, as we find it this evening? 1 Timothy <coughs> chapter number 6. And we'll begin reading in verse number 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us, therewith, uh, let us be there with content. And if you'll jump down with me uh, to verse number 17. Verse number 17. Charge them that are rich in the world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Our fathers, we come to you tonight. We ask you to speak to us once again. Father, I pray that we would open the Bible by faith and believe that every time we read your words, we have something to learn. We have something, God, that you want to speak to us about. God, may we be ready, anxious, willing. Uh, Father, just able to understand and receive what you have for us here tonight. We ask this all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. You may be seated. February, we've been going over stewardship. Stewardship month here at Regency Baptist Church. And oftentimes, <coughs> when we think about what it means to be a steward... We'll, we'll talk about finances, and that, that, that's a part of stewardship. Stewardship is giving God every part of your life. It's saying, God, I give you my children as a parent to be a good steward of the children you've given me. It's God, help me to be a good steward of the church and my part as a giver in my talents and my time. My investment into the local New Testament church as a, as a spouse to be a good steward. A steward is a manager of another's possessions. The Bible says, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. In other words, we need to be careful how we use these bodies God's given us. We need to be conscious of what we do with the things that God has given us. If you could say it like this, God has lent it to us and says, I'm going to come back one day and find out what you did with what I've given you. That's what stewardship is. What are you doing with the life, the time, the talents, the treasures, the testimony, and the truth that God has given to you? What are you doing? The things that you can control in this life. I like being able to make a plan and execute that plan. But no matter how good I make a plan, I understand that God's going to bring things in my life along the way that I just didn't expect. But there are things that I can control. There are things that I have responsibility over. I'm responsible today whether or not I came to church. I'm responsible for how I respond to people when I want, maybe want to lash out in anger. I'm responsible for my testimony and my reputation. God has control of all things, but he's given you a responsibility to be a good steward with the things that he's given you. And tonight I want you to talk to, talk to you about the things, about your finances, about your treasures. And we take this thought from this passage tonight, what's mine is thine. What's mine is thine. And you think about this, if you will, with me on a week where we celebrate Valentine's Day in a couple of days. And maybe you'll have plans to go out to dinner, or maybe you already did, or maybe you will in the future, or maybe, you know, you'll just say, I love you, and that's great, whatever you do. But we're reminded on that special bond between a husband and wife. And when you get married, the Bible says, you twain shall be one flesh. You become one flesh in many ways. You start to learn that you have habits that differ one another. You have interests that differ one another. You have finances that come to be one. Your things become one. My, my wife and I, when we uh, got married, I, I got a truck and I had my vehicle as well. And she'd say sometimes, oh, you know, I was driving and, and, and she'd refer to it as her car. Her car that I bought 
in college, before we got married. But she said, but you have your truck, and so that's my car. I said, no, they're, they're both mine. But they're both yours as well, honey, of course. You know, we, we understand this in marriage, that it's not my vehicle and my room or, you know, my uh, spatula or my, you know, we can be so funny about these things. And, and especially in marriage, we understand that, that principle that what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. I don't know how you do it, but uh, may, maybe you have separate bank accounts. Maybe you share bank accounts. And my wife and I, for, it works better for us. We, we, we have that together. I think, I think that's more natural to do that. I think especially you need to be honest and open with everything, especially your finances. But in every area of life, there ought to be a oneness. Everything I possess is yours. Everything you possess is mine. What's mine is thine. And we understand that in marriage, but we don't understand that as Christians. That we as children of God are given everything by the Lord, and he says, but they're still mine. And I've given them to you, so for now they're yours, but they're mine as well. So what's mine is thine, and what's thine is mine. Praise the Lord, God says, I'll let you enjoy the riches that I possess. I'll let you enjoy the splendor of heaven where I abide. I'll let you have a mansion Streets of gold and gates of pearl. I'll let you have a new body and be like me one day. And to be in heaven, the Mormons believe that we will be as gods. We will not be gods. The Bible says we'll be like him. In other words, we'll have a glorified body. We'll no longer have to battle sin. But there's only one true God. We'll be like him, but we will not be him. But he says this, what I have, it's all yours. Now we like that part. We like the part that says, my home is your home, and my things are your things, and my son, the son of God who came, he's yours, and all that I possess is yours, and and now he gives us things in the world, and we say, "But, but that's my money. That's my house, God. That's my car. That's my, you fill in the blank, and we're glad that God is willing to share his riches with us, but we have such a hard time to, on the other end, say, God, what's mine is thine. I want you to see just a few principles as we look at this thought of, of our a stewardship of our finances this evening. My, my goal through this is not for you to go home and say, empty the bank accounts, empty the assets, ent- empty the retirement fund, empty everything, give it all to the church. I'm not saying not to do that. <laughs> but that's not what I'm telling you to do tonight, okay? So if you leave here and say, that's what pastor said, here you heard it first, you are lying. That's not what I'm getting at. But we'll look at some principles as stewards of our finances. Number one, the goal in money. The goal in money, verse six. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. We find some principles about what God gives us and our heart towards what God gives us. What's the goal? Why does God give us things? Why does God meet our needs? Why does God give us excess? Why does God bless our hearts? I think first and foremost, we understand here that God desires to meet our needs. In fact, he even commands in the model prayer to pray this and give us this day our daily bread. I don't believe that's a prayer that you have to sit down and pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come and go through the prayer as some repetitious thing. The Bible says we're not supposed to pray in vain repetitions. But he gives us a model over things to pray for. One of the things he said is pray for your daily needs. I want to hear about not just the big things, not just your dreams, not just retirement, not just vacation, not just ambition, but every day, God, help provide lunch for me today. Give me safety on the way to work today. Give me help in this meeting I'm about to go to. God, give me health for the the class I'm about to teach. Give us this day our daily bread. God desires to meet your every needs, big and small, every needs. And so he gives us things in life that help us to meet those needs. He, I believe, in in what he gives us has a desire in this goal to keep us content. In other words, to give us no reason to ever look at God and wag our finger and say, God, you just never cared about me. 
You never took care of me. And you never loved me. And everyone else always got everything. But I never got anything. He said, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Godliness with contentment, he said, is great gain. Do you know that contentment is a learned attribute? It's not something that's natural. It's not something where you just say, oh, it's easy to be content. We always want more. We want more out of the world. We want more out of the pleasures of life. We want more out of things. Paul said this, in whatsoever state I am, I have learned to be content. I had to learn it. He said, I've had everything and I've had nothing. And in the highs and lows in life, I had to learn and teach myself to be okay with what God has given me. You look at the stage of your life that you're in, and maybe you could look at a time in your life where you had it better financially than you do now. Maybe you think of a time where you had it worse financially than you are now. Either way, we ought to be content. We ought to be okay with what God's given us for today. Are we alive today? Has God given us the ability to live, and the Bible says, with food and raiment, food in your stomach and clothes on your back, be okay with all the things that God has given to you. Not only that, but I think as, as one of the things we see is that God sometimes gives us to meet our needs, but other time he gives us in excess. In other words, above and beyond, things like Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is not a necessity. The sports channel is not a necessity. Extra money for coffee products is a necessity, but... Um, you guys have been giving me a hard time lately getting into, getting into coffee stuff, but there's certain things that we just have to do to get by in life, and I'm convinced that that is one of those things, especially when you have five children, but God gives us an excess, and we go, man, I'm just having a hard time, but we, we have the Wi-Fi, we have the streaming services, we have the you know, membership to the you know, gym we never go to, and we have the you know, fun stuff that we do. We have the one vacation, but not the two. We have all this stuff, and say, God... But, but, but it's not enough. God gives us an excess, and I wonder, maybe not so that we can give constantly to ourselves, maybe so that we can be a blessing to others, or give to the local New Testament church. You find the example in Acts. We find times where they sold their homes, and they came and said, man, so we can further the work of God, let us give. And they had sacrificial giving. They had faithful giving. They had giving to honor the work of God as it went on. We can't go forward as a church without the giving of God's people. This is how we operate. This is how we do anything in our ministries. Any ounce of, you know, of electricity, electricity isn't measured by ounces, I understand that. Um, anything that we do is based off of the giving of God's people. God wants to work through you. He wants to work through you to be a blessing to somebody else. He wants to work through you for the work of the ministry. He wants to work through you to provide for your children. He wants to work through you for many other ways. There's a goal in what God gives us in our finances. Number two, the grief in money. Verses nine and 10, it says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Wow. It says, they that be rich. Now, if we didn't know the rest of this verse, we would think, oh, those are the ones that have it all figured out. That, that's the American dream. Those are the success stories. Man, those are the ones that, that have a plan and execute that plan. I don't believe here God's saying it's sinful to be rich. It's sinful to have things. It's sinful to be successful in this world. But he's saying there's a, there's a possible destruction that can come with it. He says they fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. I read one day a story of a man who won the lottery and he talked about all the things that happened afterwards. He said his family turned against him and they wanted and so he gave and they became bitter because he gave more to somebody else or wouldn't give any more. So many catastrophic things happened in his life by the end of it. He ended worse than he started. He said, the worst thing that ever happened to me was winning the lottery. The worst thing that ever happened in my life was that day that some would say, the greatest day, that I won the jackpot, I won the lottery. 
There's a grief that comes sometimes with our monies. In other words, God says this, you can fall into temptation. It can be a snare in your life where all of a sudden you think you have it figured out because you have something to have comfort in in your bank account. And I'll tell you what, I'll be the first one to tell you what some of the hardest places to go soul winning are in well-to-do areas. And by no means am I saying that they're bad people, but I'm saying this, finances have a way of changing our outlook on life if we're not careful. This isn't that if you have it, this is how it's going to be. It's that this is a possibility, a temptation. In other words, you can be tempted to allow this to become a snare in your heart to the Lord. Somebody told me one day, Pastor, I want to I wanna give to this. And I said, man, are you sure you just gave to that? And they said, you know what? I need to. I'm scared if I don't give. Man, what an amazing testimony. I'm afraid not to give with what God has given me. He says there's a temptation. There's, there's lust that you can fall into. There's destruction that can come your way that drown men in destruction and perdition. And then number three, the giving in money. The giving in money. Lastly, verse 18. It says that they, I'm sorry, verse 17. Charge them. Charge them that are rich in the world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Now understand by that passage, God is saying this, that as a steward, you are rich in Jesus Christ. Riches don't just come with our finances. You're rich in your eternity. You're rich in that you have the Spirit of God. You're rich in the wisdom from the Word of God that He gives you. You're rich in the fact that God fills you with His Spirit and His power. You're rich (coughs) in your salvation. You're rich eternally as a child of God. He says, in Christ Jesus, you are rich. You're not rich because of worldly things. You're rich because of Jesus Christ. So here's the charge, verse 18. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. I believe this. No matter what the salaries are in our families, no matter what each individual makes in the church, I believe if we use faithfully and honestly what God has commanded us, God's going to take care of the church. God's going to take care of you individually. You say, but what if the numbers don't add up? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He says that you're rich in good works and ready to distribute and willing to communicate. In other words, just be a good steward with what I've given to you. Don't worry about the dollar amount. Don't worry about how it compares to somebody that has more or has less. Don't worry about how it affects the bottom line. Be faithful, be obedient, be joyful, be sacrificial, be moved by the Spirit to give when I command you to give. He takes care of the church. He takes care of you individually. We find scores of examples all throughout the Bible. I hope it's not, and I work very hard at it. I don't believe my wife and I have ever missed a tithe check since we've uh, since we've been married, even before marriage. Well, we'll always give more, and what's personal to you might be personal to you, but we'll give above that 10%. And I tell you what, it scares me. It scares me to think that I might rob God by not giving him what he's given to me first. By not saying, Lord, what's mine is thine, and maybe when there's an ability to give more, to say, hey, we have an opportunity here, and maybe to spend on fun things, or maybe to do other things, but maybe to to give more to the church. He says, I want you to be rich in your good works, ready to distribute what I've given to you, willing to communicate. In other words, just use what I've given to you. All of mine is yours. I just expect the same in return. Do you have a heart to give with what God has given to you? Do you have a heart to be a blessing to other people? There's three ways we can give in our tithes, in our offerings, and by alms. Number one is commanded, the dollar amount, 10% of our gross income. God says 10%, that's my part. It's the definition of a tithe. That's what's mine given to God. 
offering as a God purposeth in his heart, so let him give. In other words, God may move in your heart in a random time and say, you know what, I've given to you so you can meet that need. That's our offering, above and beyond our tithe. And then alms, where you might see somebody in need and you say, you know what, I can help that need. I can be a blessing to that individual. That part's not always done in the church. It's always done face-to-face with people. I pray, Regency Baptist Church, that we learn how to be a giving people. That we don't look to God and say, man, ain't it good to have all the things that God has given to me? And God says, now where's mine in return? And we say, oh Lord, what's yours is mine, but what's mine is mine. I hope that our, our heart is to be cheerful, again, loving and faithful and sacrificial in what we are commanded to give. May we be good stewards in our time and talents and treasures and testimony and truth and be faithful with all the things, all the things that God has given to us. Father in heaven, as we come to you tonight, may we be honest, Lord, in our hearts to say, have I had a spirit of it's mine or that what's mine is thine? Father, forgive me, forgive us if we've maybe been tempted in that way to think that what's ours was ours to begin with or will be ours even in eternity. I know there's things that we can do to be responsible and prepare and maybe to to plan for the unexpected in our lives. I also know we're commanded to give, to be people through, through whom the work of God can flow through. That the blessings don't stop with people, but that they flow through people. God, I pray that our desire would be that, to be a people that the blessings of God flow through. Father, help us, I pray, with heads up.